we're going to look at their current plan. And let's say um, this area up here uh, at the top, this blue box at the top are the assumptions we're going to make. So on their current plan, let's say uh, I'm going to use a hypothetical couple at age 40 up here. They tell me they want to uh, retire at 70 and start taking income at 71. We'll fill those in. So uh, we've got, they're putting money in. They've been good savers in a qualified plan. Both husband and wife are saving. They've got an employee match. And so now it's important for me to level set with them. Uh, <clears throat> so most people are postponing their taxes to the future. They haven't taxed me later accounts, right? So um, it's nice to bring this up because again, most people that are putting money in qualified plans don't understand that they're postponing both the tax and the tax calculation to sometime in the future as defined by Uncle Sam, right? And so most people are not aware of this tax risk. I had a guy that works for a pharmaceutical firm, got close to a million and a half in his qualified plan. He's a PhD research scientist. Uh, he saw this and was shocked. No one ever told me this, Tom. People look at their statements, they think it's all their money, right? And it never was, it never will be if it's qualified, right? So what tax bracket are you in? Well, let's say this couple looks at the chart and says, and suddenly they'll come back here and say, oh yeah, we could be in the 36% tax bracket or, or the 40% tax bracket when we retire. The next step is plan fees. Like Mr. and Mrs. Jones, had you never met me, what kind of fees do you think you'd be paying? Forbes reports that the average mutual fund manager charges 4.17% in fees, which are not required to be disclosed to the account holder. You know, they, they at least think they're paying four, four, five percent. Let's say they say four and a half. So now, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, uh, let's say you never met me again. You're continuing down this path with your current plan, right? Um, what kind of rate of return do you think you could get? So I pop up the S&P 500 for the last 22 years. So uh, since 2000, if you were in the markets uh, uh, in the S&P uh, using the buy, hold, and pray strategy, you would have made 5.5% compounded annual growth rate. And this is pre-tax, obviously, right? Because it's in a 401k right? Wall Street will promote that 7% as the mathematical average we all learn in second grade, right? But uh, what, what we don't learn in second grade is that it doesn't work very well. Averages don't work well when there are negative numbers in the, uh, in the grouping. Someone's being unrealistic and they want to put 10 or 12 or 14, make them prove it to you, right? Or ask them, you know, how they did in 2008, because we're averaging two major market corrections per decade, right? And uh, we haven't had one in over 12 years or 13 years. So it's coming, right? And it's how you do in those market bad years that's critical. A lot of, that's counterintuitive for most people. So um, again, you've, you've got what you need. Let's say they put a number in here. Uh, I don't know, even 5%. Even if I think that's high, I'll, I'll let them get away with it. Now, the last question I have for them here is, you know, um, what kind of... Um, income do you think you need, Mr. or Mrs. Jones, to maintain your lifestyle in retirement? I want you to be able to visit your kids and grandkids, do any travel, uh, golf, tennis, fishing, boating, whatever you like to do, whatever. You know, I want you to be able to do those same things. Maintain your current lifestyle in retirement, right? So, so uh, a couple like this might say, a very typical couple like this might say, Tom, we could live on $150,000 a year. So they plug that number in, we plug that number in and um, uh, the dashboard is what this called always gives these numbers you see here like cumulative taxes and cumulative uh, fees. All these numbers are based on this future age. So I'm going to go right to age 76 uh, or she, excuse me, I'll go to 77 because they're running out of money as you see down here at the bottom of the column at age 76. So Given the assumptions we've made, and this couple, this couple, these couples, good savers, they're going to save going forward. They've got a big match, right? They're they're uh, they think one hundred fifty thousand is conservative because they're making two fifty or three hundred. They think oh, I can live on the one hundred fifty. You know, when I uh, when we retire, that should be enough money. 
right? They're running out of money at age 76, right? And look, if they're blessed to live to age 77, they will have paid $1.7 million in fees alone. So, and the tax, the, and the taxes they've paid are over a half million bucks, 571,000, right? So this is shocking to them because they're running at, they're good savers. They're running out of money at 76. And this is sobering for most people. And here's an example. This should disturb them, right? And we haven't even talked about inflation, by the way. I don't, I don't, uh, we do, our system does inflation up here. You can put an inflated number in there, but you'll scare the crap out of them. And you can talk about inflation and the eroding power of their dollar. So at age 77, they're running out of money. So this couple realizes quickly, hey, we can work longer, but we're retiring at age 71, right? Uh, maybe taxes won't go up as high, but they could go up higher. What, what? Maybe we could get a better rate of return. There are only a few variables. We could save more, but I assume if you could save more, you would already be doing that. Usually one of the spouses will say, oh, honey, we could we could probably live uh, comfortably and pay our bills on 110,000 a year. Okay, if they could live on 110, that gets them to age 79. So we'll go to age 80 here, right? But look, if they get to age 80, they're blessed to live to age 80. Look at the fees they paid, $1.825 million. And that could be low. I think they're paying more in fees. The average couple I meet is paying more in fees that they don't know about, right? So, and look, they only got a million bucks, a million, 1.019 million bucks in income after tax income from their qualified plan. Why is that? This is what they don't realize sometimes. Remember, Uncle Sam is your unintended and uninvited partner in retirement, right? You got this tax. Um, they got to pull out 171000 and pay tax on it, state, federal, and whatever other tax before this 110 hits their pocket. So look, AARP says here, Americans lose $17 billion a year due to bad retirement advice with hidden fees and unfair risk. Say, listen, most people are good savers. They're really good at what they do every day, but it is a matter of focus, not intelligence. And in the absence of a better idea, what do people do? They follow the herd. That's what they're doing in a 401k. It's not your fault. It's what most people do. Uh, look, here's the guy, Jack Bogle started Vanguard. They're the largest purveyor of mutual funds worldwide and widely regarded as low cost leader. He said, you put up 100% of the capital, you took 100% of the risk and you only got 33% of the return. They're, they're headed for the perfect financial storm in retirement with their current plan. They're running out of money at 79 and they're at, at best case. And they could easily be running out of money if some of these numbers go go a bit south. They could be running out of money much earlier, unfortunately, right? And we haven't even talked about inflation. And if you feel you need inflation, go ahead. They Let's say they've said $110,000. You say, uh, let's put 3% in here for, let's just put 2.5% for inflation in here. That means in tomorrow's dollars, down here at the bottom of the screen in yellow, they're going to need $236,000 a year when they turn 71. If we plug $236,000 in here, let's see how fast they run out of money. <laughs> $236,000. They're running out of money at 74. So with inflation, this is probably a more realistic number. It's sad, but true. So, boom, I, I hit the tax-free plan, right? Here's their current plan. That's what they're doing. Now you're going to talk about this new plan. And we've imported their the, the carrier illustration data. This is an actual IUL carrier. Notice that we import all fees, costs, and expenses. Most agents stay away from fees, costs, and expenses because they have no way to do a comparative analysis of them. This is a uh, client putting uh, 20 grand a year away and premiums up to age 68. And, um, and then they're going to take some money out in income. It looks like $94,000 a year to age 120. You can see in that column. Now, uh, this couple, uh, they don't know what an IUL is, right? It's the Swiss army knife of financial strategies, right? And uh, 
you know, you can talk about how it has living benefits, right? And this isn't your grandfather's Oldsmobile or whatever. It's not your, it's not the old um, permanent whole life insurance that most people are familiar with. And most people, excuse me, have the, uh, have the uh, misperception that it's just a love product. It, they're buying insurance only for someone they love. If you want to talk about tax codes, Tefra, Defra, and Tamra, the money going in and out, all kinds of visuals, right? So, and look up here with the graphs. Now that same S&P graph we gave you, we give you a side-by-side -side column with the S&P with, uh, with a hypothetical 0% floor and 13% ceiling. So they start to understand it's wildly more important what they don't lose in market bad years, right? So they've consciously given up some of the upside in market good years for an absolute guarantee of no downside in bad years. Now you want to be careful to tell, tell them that carriers vary with caps and floors and whatever state you're in, but this is effectively how indexing works. And you want, this helps you walk through some of those concepts. So they understand what you're talking about with the tech tree plan. You can talk about the annual lock-in and reset feature, um, this is a slide created by Doug Andrew 22 years ago, <laughs> and it still is very helpful today. Got all kinds of stuff. You can look at the worst decade in U.S. market history with a cap of zero and a cap of 12 and a floor of zero. You know, all the, some of the, um, um, some sample decades with the same cap and floor. You want to talk about living benefits? We got the whole list of uh, living benefits here. Most people think they'll never need long-term care, but, it, you know, 70% of people that get to this age uh, over 65 will need some form of long-term care services. So, and there's, uh, again, caps and floors side by side, right, with and without dividends so they can see both. So while you would have done a lot better with dividends in the S&P, their account's still taxable. The IUL is income tax-free. Say, excuse me, the same chart there. So you'll notice continuity. They've seen, they've seen some of these pop-ups before, but now we're filling them in for comparative analysis with an IUL. Uh, and it's all this stuff, you know, their plan has all these fees, right? The money's going down the drain with fees and taxes. You know, our plan, instead of a tax me later account, this is a tax me never account, right? So you have some continuity in what you've said and talked about with the client. This couple, I'll say, okay, let's take the 480 out of it. Let's say we can't get access, cannot get access to that 480,000. We're going to do an apps, apples to apples comparison. And with just the 26,000 they're saving, plus they get the match, the IUL gets no match. And I think this IUL, we put in 20,000 as the number. Notice it grosses up the pre-tax uh, contribution. Either way, if you type in the pre-tax number, it's going to put in the post-tax number in for the IUL or vice versa when you're talking with the client. That's nice. And um, let's go to the illustration. I can't remember the income. The income here was... 94,315 was the number coming out of the IUL to 120. We're going to put the same number, same amount of income coming out of both plans. Now, this is important because you want your prospect to see an apples to apples comparison. The same, whatever money you're putting in, you're putting the same money in pre tax, post tax, same money coming out uh, post tax, right? So they intuitively understand this is a fair, fair and balanced equation. So their plan is running out of money down here at age 77 under this scenario with the same money going in and out. So I say, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, let's go to age 78 then and look at the numbers. If you are blessed, uh, you want to look down here in the lower right. If you're blessed to live to age 78, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, and you stay with your 401k rather than doing this IUL, just redirecting what you're currently saving, you will have made approximately, uh, conservatively, a $2.6 million financial error for you and your family. $2.6 million. That means you will have leaked or lost, unknowingly or unnecessarily, $2.6 million 
by just staying with your 401k. Now, what, what I tell my clients I do is I'm a safe money, no market risk guy. I help prevent business owners and individuals from leaking and losing money unknowingly and unnecessarily. And if I can prevent you from leaking $2.6 million by age 78, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, isn't that the equivalent of me making that money for you? All financial advisors are going to try to grow your money as quickly as possible, right? And hopefully try to protect you from some risk. But if I can keep you from leaking 2.6, that's just as good as I made it. And I don't have to take a lot of risk to get to, to get that 2.6, right? Like, look, if they live to age 88, they've lost $3.2 million is the total advantage in this case. I mean, that's staggering. And I think the average 40-year-old is projected to live beyond 88 on average if they live past 60, I think it says. So <clears throat> look, many advisors say, oh yeah, continue to contribute to the 401k so you can get the employer match. Well, look, the employer match, uh, you know, to put it frankly, is kind of like a sample of crack cocaine for most people. Why? Because it keeps them doing the very thing that's going to cause their financial destruction in the future. That 6,000 is one of the biggest matches I've ever seen. I had a gal at Bloomberg, single gal. She gets $8,200 a year in a match. And uh, that's the biggest match I've ever seen for, for someone putting the federal maximum in. Uh, but and she immediately abandoned the match once she saw these numbers. Do you is it worth it to you to lose three point two million to get a six thousand dollar year match? I mean, come on, right? So uh, any agent or advisor that tells their client without doing the math that oh yeah, continue to contribute to get the match is is performing financial malpractice. That's what it is. They didn't do the math. It's counterintuitive, yes, but. Um, it's, it's something you want to know. Try to tell them that without doing the math here, right? Try to look at the fee differential. If they get, uh, let's go back to age 78, when the 401k dried up and blew away like a tumbleweed here, right? 77. Let's look at the fee differential. While the IUL has fees, why would you want to pay an extra 829,000 in fees to your 401k? What do you get for it? It blows away like a tumbleweed at age 77. At least with an IUL, you've got, um, at least with an IUL, you get something for it, right? You're, you, you know, you get some value for it, so for fees. Uh, notice too that we talk about death benefit. Uh, most people don't associate a death benefit with their current investing plan, but I like to get them started thinking about that now. There is a death benefit for a 401k. It's what's ever left over. Look, at age 70, you can go to age 70 before they run out of money. What's the death benefit for their 401k? It's $670,000. What's your death benefit for the IUL? $1.5 million, right? So there is a death benefit. It's just people aren't used to thinking about it in those terms. They only think about death benefit when they think about life insurance. So apples to apples, uh, here's a takeaway. We can go to our total advantage scorecard. See the scorecard tab down here in green at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to click it. I'm going to go right to the uh, total advantage scorecard. At age 78, should they be blessed to live that long? Their plan died on the vine at age 77. Your plan goes to 120. It gives you a, a, the delta, all this stuff. What's the total advantage, right? And then we can go to um, page two where we give them all the assumptions. These are the assumptions we used to generate this, in, this projection and side-by-side -side comparison between an IUL and their current plan. So they know how you came to, that, came to those numbers. And here's a reminder down at the bottom of, of their plan benefits, right? So lots of people forget that Permanent life insurance has college aid advantages, right? Or chronic and critical illness advantages, or it increases their collateral capacity. When's the last time you mentioned to an IUL prospect that you're going to increase their collateral capacity? 